The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O Lord, mercifully receive the prayers of your people who call upon you, and grant that they may know and understand the things they ought to do, and also may have grace and strength to accomplish them. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Welcome to the podcast for the sixth Sunday after the Epiphany, uh, Luke chapter 6, verses 17 to 26. As I mentioned last week, um, we have three new podcasts this year because the last time was Series C. It was a short Epiphany season, and these texts did not occur. Um, if you go back a few weeks to Luke chapter 4, uh, 16 to 30, the Sermon in Nazareth, I hope that you could see that this was the beginning of Luke's way of developing a Christology, a prophet Christology. And last week I talked about how, based on that prophet Christology, Luke now begins to build an ecclesiology. And of course the prophet Christology, who Jesus is, that's the foundation stone of the church. Last week was the call of Peter. Peter is a, a foundational stone. And as I said last week, it's not Peter, it's what Peter does and hears from Jesus, that it's confession and absolution, the office of the keys, that the church is founded on what is given to Peter by Jesus, that the church is founded on the, the confession and absolution that he receives there uh, from Jesus when he says, be not afraid. In today's text, that we begin the Sermon on the Plain, there's going to be today and next week two texts in the Sermon on the Plain. If there was one more season, uh, one more Sunday in Epiphany, we'd have all three texts from the Sermon on the Plain, but only two now. But what we see here is that just before this text is the calling of the Twelve, and they are the final foundation stones. Uh, Levi the tax collector is another one that the church is built on the gospel, on the narrative, on the life of Jesus. So you have Jesus, Peter, Matthew, gospel, and now you have the twelve. And here is the first teaching to the twelve. But you can see here that Luke is still kind of making sure that we understand Christology before he gets into the sermon. So as we go to the text here, I want you to see that we begin with a very important uh, introduction here about the, the healings that Jesus is doing. And we have really two parts to this text. We have a, a 17 to 19, which is sort of an introduction, and then 20 and following, which is the beginning of the Sermon on the Plain. Now, it says that Jesus comes down to them, and he took his stand on a level place. There is where we can see the beginning of the Sermon on the Plain. This is why it's called the Sermon on the Plain. And I want you to see that th there's a crowd, a great crowd of disciples, and then there's a multitude of the people. Now, th this is really interesting how he does this here because you can, you can see here that these might be a little different groups, you know? It, it's, it's interesting he begins with crowd and Laos. They're essentially the same thing. But this is a crowd of disciples, and so it is a little different. And some of you know that, that I talk about how there are these circles around Jesus of the various audiences. You know, the 12 is the, the one that is most intimate, then the 70. Uh, and that might include some of the women that, that accompanied Jesus. Then you've got the laos or the hokloi. These are the faithful remnant. You know, and then you have the religious establishment. Okay? And if Jesus is talking to them, it's only them. If he's talking to them, they're going to hear it and vice all the way through. Now, I think these disciples here means that he's talking to this group right here. But then it does say a great crowd of the people. So that brings it up here as well. So, in a sense, this group is part of this first part of the text. Now, down here, it just says his disciples. And so I'm going to suggest down here that this is the 70 plus the women. But there may be 
Hakloi who are listening to this, but we're going to talk about the Sermon on the Plain, which starts here in verse 20, as being directed to the apostles. In fact, it's the first, <coughs> excuse me, it's the first teaching of Jesus to the apostles. Now, um, let's, let's go back and, and look now at, at what we have um, uh, in concerning this great multitude of the people. There's a geographical location here. Judea, <clears throat> Jerusalem, and you can see here it says the coastal region of Tyre and Sidon. Now, these are a lot of people, and this is from all over. This is down in Judea. Jerusalem, of course, is in Judea. <coughs> and Tyre and Sidon is in the north. And it says that they came, and this is an infinitive of purpose, in order to hear him, which means they are catechumens. And here is the teaching part of the prophet Christology. And then the accompanying infinitive is, and to be healed from their diseases. And here are the miracles of healing. And these are the two things that Jesus essentially does. And he is rejected for that, teaching and healing. That's the, the second part of the prophet Christology. So these two taken together is the first part of the prophet Christology. And he's continuing to do that. In, implied in here is that he's teaching and healing together. And this is, I think, a very important thing to continue to see throughout the gospel. Luke is going to beat us over the head with this. Again and again and again and again, he's going to say this to us. Um, it says in the second part that there is also those who are troubled from evil spirits. Now, that in a sense comes up into the miracle character, and they're healed by him. Now, I have mentioned before, but I'll say it again, Jesus comes to release, this is the sermon in Nazareth, people from four things, demons, Sickness, sin, and death. And if you remember, in the text two weeks ago, um, he rebukes the demon, and it comes out of him. He rebukes the fever of Peter's mother-in-law, and it comes out. Same word, rebuke. For Jesus isn't a Gnostic. He's not a dualist. He doesn't distinguish between body and soul. He, he does, you know a work of freeing people from the virus of sin as it infects them in many different ways. And the paralytic is the first time he really forgives sins, although I think he forgives sins with Peter when he says, be not afraid, Rise, raises the widow's son at Nain and Jairus' daughter. I mean, th there's the bondage that he's doing. And now we come back to the, look at how the frame here, all the crowd were seeking, and what are they doing? To touch him. This is so important. Uh, Luke is really telling us here that the, the flesh of Jesus, the creator, who has come to his creation to set it free, that when Jesus' flesh touches other people's flesh, you know, it, in, and this is, I, I love this statement, the power is going out of him, and he is healing them all. Now, this is the great exchange. I think a lot of people don't see this, that what... What Jesus does in his healing is that <clears throat> he absorbs, you know, the onslaught of the demons, the sicknesses, the sin, you know, and he absorbs that into his flesh, <clears throat> and then his flesh gives out release, it gives out freedom, it gives out healing, it casts out the demons, and it's like a power that's going out of him, but it also is taking in that bondage. So he is the sin bearer. You know, well, I mean, we could say he's sin bearer from the moment he's conceived, but publicly, after his baptism, he is the sin bearer. He is the one who has come to heal the creation. And this is all new creation stuff. If you remember back in, in 4, oh boy, what is it, 44? You know, at the end of that text, you know, it is necessary for me to preach the good news, that's the gospel, that is the kingdom of God, for that's why I was sent. The good news is the new creation, that he has come to release people from bondage through his teaching and his healing. 
Uh, and that's the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is the new creation that has now come in Jesus. You could preach on this alone, but it is the Sermon on the Plain, and you really can't not preach on the Sermon on the Plain. So let's go to this, and I think we can get, at least we can get the Beatitudes in there. Okay, here Jesus is lifting their eyes upon them, the disciples, and he says, okay, so as I said earlier, this, this is probably a more inner group. And this is the first sermon Jesus addresses to his disciples. Um, I have an entire excursus on the Luke and Beatitudes. And I encourage you, as you prepare for this sermon, to take a look at it. There are a number of them, and I think they're all linked together. These are, in, in some cases, the most important because they do address, you know, kind of the, 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 the fundamental way that we think of Beatitudes. Remember that eologeo, which is a blessing, you know, it's the word that we sometimes translate blessing as a vertical blessing from God. Makarios is horizontal. So this, this is how we are seen in the world, makarios. And you can see Luke only has four of them. And they are going to ba balance the four woes down here. Look at, they're all there. The four woes. So four Beatitudes, four woes. Um, this is, more than Matthew, a more Jewish way of teaching. This is from Deuteronomy. Uh, this is the, the blessings. This is the way of life. And the woes, this is the way of death. And what we're talking about here, and this is very, very, very important, is we're talking ontology. We're talking about being. This is who you are. And we're going to see that the, this ontology, this being, is Christological. Because these Beatitudes, as Dr. Scare said so many years ago in his book on the Sermon on the Mount, groundbreaking the way he did this, that, that these are gospel. This, this is first and foremost speaking about Christ and then about us. I, I really, in many ways, channel Dr. Scare on page 287 of the, the Luke uh, commentary when I talk about the Christological character of the Beatitudes, that Luke's hearer would look beyond themselves to the one who was poor for them, who hungered for them in the wilderness, who wept, who received hate, insults, etc. So, I mean, th this, is, this is being. In the, the text for next week, we're going to have a series of imperatives. There's a ton of them. And you'll see, I think there's 16 of them in all. These imperatives flow out of the being. And these are doing. If this is who you are, then this is what you do. And we're going to see that this is gospel too. Now, w these are very familiar to us. And, and Luke has, you know, as I said, only four. And, you know, you don't want to say they're the most important four, but they certainly do resonate. The poor, um, the hungry, the crying, the weeping, and then those who are persecuted, who are hated by men. Um, you can see here that... Uh, in each one of these, um, there's a haughty. Um, this one, of course, is a hatan, but very similar. When, instead of... Um, th these are causal. This is uh, more of a temporal. Um, blessed are the poor. Theirs is the kingdom of God. Remember what I said about the kingdom of God. It's the new creation, at least up to this point. And I always speak about how the kingdom of God has a king, and that king is, is, is coronated on a cross. So I think it's important to recognize that the kingdom comes uh, at the cross, you know. But that's when the new creation comes as well. The hungry now, you know, that goes back to the Magnificat. Hungry, you know, it's the center of the chiasm in the Magnificat. This language of satisfaction, this is the language of the feeding of the 5,000, they shall be satisfied with the 12 baskets of leftovers even. It, when Jesus comes, you know, the, those who are hungry now, when he comes, 
there is more. There's always more with Jesus. And, you know, obviously these, you know, in a sense speak of the, 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 the parousia, but they're already now, you know. They're already now because of the connection, the being, the ontological communion with Christ. And then this one, in many ways, is the, 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 the one that is fleshed out. It's got two hatons, you know. Uh, you can see here in, in 22, when men hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and throw out your name as evil. Notice your name. That's the name that you get in baptism. That because you bear the presence of Christ, his name in you. And it is on account of the Son of Man, you know. The account of the Son of Man It's so important. Son of Man being a title of Jesus in his suffering. And that is, here's a description of suffering. So what is the other side of this? It's rejoicing. The, one of the great themes of Luke's gospel is joy. You know, joy in that day. Skip around. Because your reward is great in the heavens. You know, remember, when Christ comes, heaven comes with him. So the reward that you receive, the treasure you receive, you will see this later on in the parables of Jesus, is Jesus himself. That's the reward you get. You get communion with Jesus, that your being is Christ. And it ends by saying, for according to the same things their, prof their, their, their fathers did to the prophets. So you're in continuity with that prophetic line, that prophetic pattern. And it's a prophetic pattern of suffering. It's a prophetic pattern in which you can see that in your suffering you have a communion with Christ. As I said, only Luke has the woes. And they're parallel, you know. Instead of the, the poor, it's the rich. They're going to, they, because they have received, uh, excuse me, uh, for they have already now received in full consolation. Um, here you have, woe to you who are filled now, for you will hunger. Those of you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. And woe when all men speak well of you. Okay? Kalos. For according to the same things their fathers did to the false prophets. Now you can't help but think of the Pharisees here. And the reason I say that is because you, you can see in the, in the Lucan frame, and, and 29 to 30 really says it, that it's the tax collectors and sinners who submit themselves to John baptism, who come repenting. And, and the Pharisees do not. They reject the plan of God for themselves, and they demonstrate that by not submitting to John's baptism. And th this, this woe is really, in many ways, directed to the, these woes, directed to the religious establishment. And remember what he says about the Pharisees, that, you know, they are lovers of money, you know. Um, they are, they are the ones who, you know, fill themselves. You can even think of the rich man and Lazarus here as well. You know, they're laughing now. They think they have it all wired now, that they have a way of salvation by their works, you know. But they will weep and they will cry. The context of this, we piped to you and you did not dance. That, of course, is referring to Jesus. Wailed and you did not mourn. That's John the Baptist. They did not submit to that. So this is a way of death. And it's interesting, it, 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 in a way, it, it, you know, you could say that these are acts of sinfulness, but it really is an act of self-righteousness, where they really have created an alternate means of salvation by means of their work. So, we, we have the beginning of the Sermon on the Plain here, after this magnificent d description of the prophet Christology, especially the healings, the release from, from bondage, and one of the things that I think we, we really have to do on this Sunday is to recognize and tell people who they are, that they, they are united to Christ, they are blessed because of their baptisms, because of their communion with the flesh of Jesus, and that there is healing for them in the sacramental life of the church, in the preaching, in the sacraments, in their communion with Christ. And so the, the healing that then leads to the description of ontology, the way of life, this is absolutely fundamental.
to the way in which we understand ourselves as the church. 